Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jennifer Cooley, and I am the Education and Outreach Manager for the State Historical Museum. During 2021, the State Historical Society is commemorating the upcoming 175th anniversary of Iowa statehood. The Iowa History 101 webinar series, which focuses on the past lives of Iowans, continues on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. You can learn more about this series and all of our programs on our website at iowaculture.gov. Please remember to sign up for each webinar you would like to attend, and don't worry if you can't watch live, all presentations will be recorded. Today we will learn about the evolution of Iowa's state borders, a process that began before Iowa joined the Union in 1846 and the controversy surrounding the changes. We acknowledge the indigenous peoples that have called Iowa home since time immemorial, as well as the more than 17,000 native people who live in Iowa today. We acknowledge the land now known as the state of Iowa was the ancestral home of the Iowa nation and our state is named in recognition of them. Iowa was also an ancestral home at times for the Oto Missouri, Meskwaki, Sauk, Dakota, Ho-Chunk, Omaha Ponca, and Potawatomi, as well as other tribes that passed through during various periods. The language used to identify many of our lakes, rivers, cities, counties, schools, buildings, and sites reflect the inherent imprint of indigenous peoples. We offer our respect to their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations, and acknowledge the indigenous peoples who have made essential contributions to the landscape of Iowa, including traditional, uh, traditional knowledge, experience, labor, technology, science, philosophy, and the arts. A few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Everyone came into this webinar on mute with cameras off. Closed captions are available by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. The webinar is being recorded and will be placed in the Iowa Culture page of YouTube in a few days. I have disabled the chat function, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A feature throughout the webinar. My colleague Matt Beyer is watching that feature and will prepare a list of questions for the speaker at the end of the presentation. But please note, we may not be able to get to all of the questions. Now I'm pleased to in introduce our speaker, Paul F. Anderson. Paul is an Emeritus Professor of Landscape Ar Ar Architecture and Agronomy at Iowa State University. He taught courses in ecological design, conducted research in geography information systems, uh, modeling of soils, architectural sites, and historic vegetation. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Paul to begin the webinar. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, thank you, Matt, also for helping uh, monitor the questions. In fact, you'll see in the lower left-hand uh, corner of the slides, each slide has a number. And uh, if your question relates to a particular slide, you could refer to that and uh, I can jump to it quickly if that might help us. Even though I chose to use the number 104 years of evolution and controversy, it's more like 205. 104, the first 104 anyway, uh, that's when most of the evolution, most of the controversy happened, although there are still some changes that are happening. Uh, you know, borders are, are uh, lines that are uh, not normally visible, although when you see a sign, sometimes a, a road, highway, gravel road perhaps, a uh, river in the case of our border rivers, uh, that gives you some visual cues but um, borders are often not visible and that has uh, brought some issues along. Uh, here's a photograph of an early uh, iron gate and arch. This one in Northeast Iowa near New Alban. And uh, above the sign, above the arch, Iowa welcomes you and, and uh, identifies it as a state line. Usually we don't have quite so many visual cues, at least uh, not on the back roads as this one appears to be. There are still issues that uh, pop up occasionally related to borders. 
Here's one that was in the newspaper a couple of years ago about uh, Winnebago Bend U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project. And that relates to the Winnebago Reservation that's in uh, Nebraska. And the areas, uh, I'll use my cursor to uh, point out a couple of tan areas that used to be in Nebraska, now considered Iowa and managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And that has to do with a major flood that happened after the 1865 establishment of the reservation. That flood was in 1877. We'll refer to that in a few more slides. But that uh, issue is still, and other similar issues, are still popping up because we use uh, border rivers. And uh, we want to answer questions about who was involved in the establishment of the borders. Why wasn't it easy? What events, obstacles, technology, and issues were involved? And when did those happen and, and where? So we'll begin by uh, just a, a little bit of background. This map represents a, a GIS data set that uh, I and uh, about uh, two dozen students digitized for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. And this four-year project, we helped DNR understand some uh, historic vegetation. There are other sources of historic vegetation, but this comes from the General Land Office maps and notes from 1832 to 1859. On the left side, you see a township plat map for township 80 range 22, and that's Franklin Township, Northwest Polk County. And the field notes that they were required to, uh, to document the uh, survey of the section corners and quarter corners, originally handwritten and eventually they were typed and make it a bit easier to read. There were actually five general land office surveys. Initial baseline survey down in Arkansas, Fifth Principal Meridian Survey, uh, North-South Line, three correction lines at 60 mile intervals, actually two full and two partial correction lines. And uh, don't think when you see Correctionville that it's referring to uh, incarceration, it's actually referring to where the town Correctionville was built on uh, correction line number two. Township lines were the fourth survey and township subdivisions, which took the longest, uh, the fifth survey. And then in addition, uh, we'll talk about state border surveys beginning in 1816. So lots of surveying going on. And uh, the, the project that I was involved with uh, worked with 1,667 township plat maps that were drawn surveyed by 187 different deputy surveyors during that time. And uh, a bit of an animation to show you how the survey progressed beginning in the Southeast corner. We know the half breed track and then the Blackhawk purchases number one and number two and uh, additional sessions brought along different uh, additional surveys. Every once in a while, you'll see uh, a few townships in yellow that are not near the majority of townships, and those represent resurveys. It took uh, surveyors about uh, 10 days, and they walked about uh, 120, 125 miles per township, uh, survey crews of, of uh, usually five on each survey crew. So we're going to be dealing with um, border rivers first. Um, Missouri River and, and Mississippi are first thought of, but don't forget Northwest Iowa, the Big Sioux, and Southeast Iowa, a bit of the De Des Moines River. And then we'll progress to the north. We'll save the uh, southern boundary. Actually, that was the first one that got started, but the one that uh, carried on um, a long, long time, and uh, we'll, so we'll deal with that one last. I guess the, the first shall be last in this case. So four rivers, two lines, 
we'll talk a bit about territorial boundaries, but mainly about statehood boundaries. And here's a crusty old uh, surveyor, one of the general land office surveyors, Ira Cook, who uh, after he was done surveying townships, he became uh, and was elected mayor of Des Moines, or should I say Fort Des Moines, because at that time that he was mayor, uh, the town was still using the name of the fort, even though the fort had been closed. Didn't last for a long time, but uh, that was Fort Des Moines number four, as I call it. Uh, timeline gives us an idea of when the southern border was uh, first uh, surveyed, 1816. And that uh, lasted through a number of court cases through uh, 1897. We'll talk a little bit about the half-breed track, the Honey War, Carter Lake, and Wisconsin, Illinois uh, issues on the Mississippi side. So 104 years generally. The GLO surveys took about 44 years, although there were some resurveys that happened after that. So thinking about our east and west borders, rivers move laterally. We know uh, hydrologically that there's a process of meandering or channel migration. And uh, one of the questions I had when I first began looking at these, and I realized in dealing with uh, 1,667 townships, the border townships were filed and referenced in a little bit different way than the uh, interior townships. So that's what really led me to start thinking more and more about the borders. And do state boundaries along rivers move? Yes or no? Actually, yes and no. Uh, the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court said it really depends. A Carter Lake is an example found in 1853, incorporated about 1860 is East Omaha. That 1877 flood that we referred to earlier with the Winnebago Reservation cut a new uh, Missouri River channel, created a, an Oxbow Lake, which was sometimes called Cutoff Lake, or uh, pardon me, or Lake Nakoma. And those of you who've been to um, the Omaha Airport probably know a bit about Carter Lake and Iowa, Nebraska, both claimed it. What to do? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1892 said, as a general rule, state boundaries follow gradual changes in the course of a river, but the exception is when a river avulses or cuts off one of its bend, as it done, uh, did in the Carter Lake area, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Carter Lake belonged to Iowa, uh, incorporated in 1930. And then another attempt, Nebraska did not give up. U.S. Supreme Court said practically impossible to locate the original boundary line. So uh, leave it the way it is. And Carter Lake area is part of Iowa. Another complication, this time thinking primarily about the Mississippi River Channel, uh, very common as you can see in the photograph, the lower right there to have braided channels, lots of narrow islands with uh, shallow channels in between. And um, initially the Supreme Court said, yes, the middle of the main channel, but then US Army Corps of Engineers began uh, straightening the channel for navigation and uh, agricultural drainage flood control changed some things in the 1920 Supreme Court case said, well, the middle of the main navigation channel, uh, they're starting to pin it down, but uh, still an issue will pop up occasionally. Congress in 1838, first territorial act said that the Iowa border was at the west bank of the Mississippi River. And then a year later, the middle, middle or center of the main channel of the Mississippi River. So concepts have changed over the years. Uh, fortunately, that one, not a lot lately. Um, when we look at the northern border and southern border, uh, the northern border uh, takes us uh, relatively little time because it's a 
border that follows a parallel, a line of latitude. Southern border, as I said, a number of issues there. Um, and we'll be uh, dealing with that one last. So Louisiana Pur Purchase, President Jefferson had made an initial offer to Napoleon for the New Orleans area. And Napoleon's counter offer says, well, how about 530 million acres for $15 million, uh, roughly equivalent to 500 million today, about three cents an acre. And that doubled the size of the US. One of the issues is after uh, Missouri became a state, where was the Northern border for the Iowa Territory? Uh, initially, uh, some areas went beyond the 49th parallel and some less. And then of course there was a treaty uh, that was actually in 1818 that helped clarify the 49th parallel as, as the Northern border. But note, we'll refer to this here in a few minutes. Uh, the Iowa Territory Western border did follow the Missouri River. Uh, during the Territorial Commission hearings of 1838, Lieutenant Albert Lee had uh, proposed the most natural boundary he could think of for uh, the north northern boundary of Iowa. And he said, well, how about if you begin at the confluence of the Big Sioux and Missouri Rivers, diagonal up to the confluence of Bur and Blue Earth and Minnesota Rivers, and follow the Minnesota River to the Mississippi, and then follow the Mississippi down. So that was one idea he had. Uh, others in Congress said, well, if, if you draw a north-south line about 40 miles west of Des Moines, and then how about an east-west line somewhere uh, through the confluence of the Blue Earth and Minnesota Rivers, might look something like that. There were counter proposals that went further west and further east and further south. But uh, here's where Stephen A. Douglas got involved. He was chairing the Senate Committee on Territories. And this is the same Stephen Douglas as you might think of the uh, Lincoln Douglas debates. He was saying, well, he said, I, I think that uh, when you really look at the areas involved, he said, I think that the, the Western part beyond that 40 mile line, over stretching over to the Missouri River, he said, I think that's more important to Iowa than the area that we now think of as Southern Minnesota. And he said that for a couple of reasons. One is he, he thought about Thomas Jefferson's proposals. We get time, we might talk about those later but also that the, uh, the Iowa territory, territory of Iowa did extend over to the Missouri River and uh, his proposal using 43 degrees, 30 minutes north latitude did preserve uh, both of those, uh, the Jeffersonian uh, ideal and the Iowa Territory boundary. So Congress passed an act in 1849, approved that latitude, 43 degrees, 30 minutes, assigned the task to the General Land Office, Commiss Commissioner Butterfield and George B. Sargent, the Surveyor General was officed at the time in uh, Dubuque. And they hired, um, a young surveyor officer, member of the Corps of Engineers, Andrew Talcott. But even though they had um, uh, approved it a few years earlier, it was delayed three years by the third worldwide cholera pandemic. So they weren't able to get started right away. They were actually delayed three years, but they said it, it is urgent to... Uh, avoid confusion and uncertainty for elections, potential for double taxation, as we'll find out in a few minutes, those issues uh, reared their ugly head in the Southern border with Missouri. And they wanted to avoid overt destructive actions to disturb the peace. So Alcott hired a survey crew of 42, 14 surveyors, some of them astronomical surveyors, 
that uh, surveyed at night, believe it or not, plus 20 uh, survey assistants, interpreter, doctor, teamsters, four cooks, hunter, and blacksmith. Good description in the 1929 article in the Annals of Iowa. They started with a, an iron post in Northeast Iowa, the West Bank of the Mississippi River near, near New Alban, made some celestial observations at night and uh, measured uh, along a straight line, perpendicular offsets to a true line of latitude. A true line of latitude is parallel to the equator. So along a straight line, which they could measure with a compass, they also measured offsets to the south, uh, one to 52 links, and a link is part of a survey chain to establish the true line, the parallel of latitude. So that was uh, a bit of a difficult thing. In fact, the difference between the straight line and the line of latitude is a little bit like, uh, remember the great circle route that you used to look at on maps and globes and how that was different, a different line than the parallel of latitude. And that's really the difference that the surveyors were respecting when they surveyed our Northern boundary. Uh, the field notes recorded land surface, soils, drainage, vegetation, tree species. Um, they terminated at the east bank of the Big Sioux River with another iron post. Final cost, about $32,000 at the time, which was considered expensive. Uh, convert that to today's dollars, about a million. And that included a bonus of a dollar per day for uh, each person completing the job within a year. Well, it took only three months. So the government ended up paying three to five dollars a day with that bonus. Captain Talcott's reactions, it's a beautiful country, but I would not give a jackknife for the whole county of it, as the distance from transportation renders it almost worthless. And the quartermaster, Sears, replied, well then, I'll have to leave it to the Indians and the buffalo. As we move to the southern border, uh, by comparison with the north border, north was easy, south border was uh, much more difficult, long and drawn out, in part because of difference in instructions, difference in technology. Uh, here's kind of a summary map, and sorry for lots of clutter, but basically our southern border represented by this black line, and it was almost 40 degrees, 35 minutes, 15 seconds. But it wasn't a straight line, and it wasn't a true line of latitude, and that ended up being one of the big controversies. The Sullivan line, named after uh, John Sullivan, the surveyor, who started, according to instructions, at the confluence of the Kansas River and the Missouri River, and basically think downtown Kansas City here, um, survey 100 miles north. And by the way, this was the original western boundary of the state of Missouri. And this triangle was added later. So he went 100 miles north and then he surveyed east. And that was essentially uh, to represent the northern extent of the uh, the Osage nation at the time. This line was also called the North Osage boundary or the old Indian boundary. Uh, the instruction said, uh, survey a latitude which passes through the rapids of the river Des Moines. However, no rapids were seen when Sullivan came to the Des Moines river and Sullivan omitted any reference to rapids on his description of the Des Moines River, calling it a small river with shallow, gentle water. So you can see here, this was a portion of a 1814 map that uh, was put together after Lewis and Clark returned. And this map does show, just uh, in the Fort Madison area, rapids. And they were called the Des Moines Rapids because they really started at the mouth of the Des Moines River and then extended about 12 river miles north. So Sullivan stopped at the Des Moines River 
And that created a problem, although some people say, well, it might have turned out better in the end. But it was a case of mistaken identity. Apparently, everyone knew about the Des Moines Rapids except uh, John Sullivan, Marquette Joliet, Zebulon Montgomery Pike, Lewis and Clark. And after the fact, Lieutenant Robert E. Lee, who in 1837 was um, a new member of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and was sent to Fort Des Moines Number 1 to map the rapids. And he was sent uh, with uh, quite a bit of, uh, quite a few explosives. And he was uh, instructed to blast a navigable channel through the rapids. And that didn't quite didn't quite uh, work because the rapids were only two and a half feet deep. Uh, Sullivan miscalculated the eastern end. He failed to adjust his compass setting to account for magnetic declination, the difference between magnetic compass north and true north. And it's, the result was that the eastern end of that boundary that Sullivan surveyed was four miles further north than it should have been. That actually came into play with the half-breed tract established by Congress, number of states. I was, was um, established by law in 1824, but didn't really uh, go into operation until 1832 with the treaty with Sac and Fox and the Black Hawk purchase here in Eastern Iowa. And this half-breed tract, some people call it the boot heel, about uh, 119,000 acres, which uh, allowed occupancy, but not ownership. And that did end up to be uh, a problem eventually. And that was uh, delineated by extending Sullivan's line further east to Fort Madison. By the way, Francis Scott Key, who you might remember, had uh, uh, a role in the national anthem. He uh, he appeared before uh, U.S. Supreme Court as a lawyer representing some of the interests here in the half-breed track. So in 1832, Jennifer Sprigg, a GLO uh, land surveyor, he established the corners and quarter corners in the mile-by-mile uh, -mile grid survey Congress uh, then changed its mind and allowed ownership. And by 1841, claim jumpers and speculators bought all of the land. And that was the end of the half-breed occupancy. By the mid-1830s, about the same time, the original survey marks from Sullivan had disappeared and settlers were uncertain. Were they living in Missouri or Iowa Territory? So the Missouri legislature hired uh, J.C. Brown, and as luck would have it, he didn't know about the Des Moines Rapids in the Mississippi River either. So he started at Great Bend near Kiyosakwa. Um, they were described as riffles in the Des Moines River. And that uh, line that he surveyed, he started about eight miles north of the Sullivan line. Missouri sheriffs were ordered to collect taxes in southern Davis and Van Buren counties. The uh, Iowan um, residents refused, and both uh, Governor Robert Lucas and Missouri Governor Boggs uh, issued proclamations. And of course, Lucas is known to have a short temper. And a Missourian cut down three honey trees. So here we are in the Honey War, 1839. Iowa sheriff sent to capture and arrest the uh, perpetrator who escaped into Missouri met the Missouri sheriff instead. A thousand Missouri militia gathered at Waterloo, Missouri. Uh, nothing much there these days except a cemetery. Uh, Governor Robert Lucas sent to Farmington U.S. Marshal 500 Iowa militia. But fortunately, it was a bloodless war because a peace delegation was sent to Waterloo also and Missouri Miss Militia had uh, disappeared by that time. Uh, Iowa Militia then went home, proclamation by both governors. 
Then the Congressional Boundary Commission was appointed with Albert Lee as commissioner. Another one from Iowa, uh, Missouri refused to appoint a commissioner, being um, obstinate apparently. But the commission did study four boundary options, the old Sullivan line, parallel of latitude through the northwest corner of Missouri, parallel of latitude through the Des Moines rapids of the Mississippi River, and then also the brown line. Um, the only one that was equitable was the Sullivan line, but it wasn't legal. Others were equitable uh, or legal, but not equitable. And more controversy went on. Missouri even organized a new North County. So President Van Buren intervened, wrote both governors. U.S. Congress Committee on Territories reviewed the history of the situation and they said, hey, that original Indian boundary has been around for a long time, that Sullivan line, even though it's not legal, it's equitable. And the committee sent a bill to Congress, but it didn't pass. So another commission was formed, one from Iowa, one from Missouri, and one from elsewhere. And their recommendation passed both legislatures, but Missouri Governor John C. Edwards vetoed um, the uh, Missouri approval and said it involved legal rights should be adjudicated only by a judicial tribunal. So by that time, both legislatures had asked Congress to pass a law authorizing a suit in the Supreme Court. And even though the wheels of justice turned slowly, uh, Missouri in, the, in front of the Supreme Court disavowed the old Indian boundary, the Sullivan line. And they said the line ought to run from the rapids in the Des Moines River, not those in the Mississippi. Iowa countered with uh, Missouri had treated the old Indian boundary as its northern uh, line until about 1836. Why not keep it? Besides, the Des Moines Rapids are in the Mississippi River. So the Supreme Court case said uh, their judgment was that the boundary should be the old Indian line. He appointed a new commission to resurvey the line. A lot of uh, monuments and markers had disappeared. Many of the original ones were wood. So they had uh, decomposed over time and were replaced by stone markers. So Northwest uh, corner of Missouri relocated and marked an iron. This is a survey by Hendershot and Miner. Uh, they straightened the Sullivan line in places and they uh, marked with iron and monuments and some wood posts. And both uh, Missouri legislature and Iowa accepted the outcome. The cost was 10,000 split equally on uh, today's dollars, about $325,000. So many monuments after that were destroyed or decayed. Disputes rose again between landowners, between the states. The U.S. Supreme Court, 1897, reaffirmed the Hendershot and Minor Resurvey, appointed a commission to resurvey a few, pardon me, a few uh, miles, about 20 miles, between mileposts 40 to 60, and they straightened it out. The corrected line was confirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. So what's the difference? Well, this 212-mile uh, boundary east-west, you look at the yellow area, focus on that for a moment. That's the area that was... Uh, primary dispute from the uh, Missouri claim, which was the brown line. Of course, that was the furthest north and the most advantageous, particularly in terms of uh, population and uh, collecting property taxes. The southern line was the Iowa claim, and that was positioned so that it uh, east-west um, intersected about the middle of the Des Moines Rapids and the Mississippi River. And the, the difference, north-south distance between the two red lines, about 15 miles. And if you measure the area, about 
3,180 square miles, a little over 2 million acres at the uh, dollar and a quarter per acre price that was uh, prevalent uh, around the time that land was being sold early days, about two and a half million dollars worth at uh, a more recent price, according to an ISU extension survey, uh, an annual survey, about $12.4 billion. So a significant area within dispute, but basically we return again and again to that original Sullivan line. By the way, I read here recently that Sullivan's supervisor, a general in the Army uh, Corps of Engineers, was dismissed uh, about 10 years after Sullivan did a survey. And his supervisor was dismissed because of incompetence. So perhaps a little bit rubbed off on John Sullivan. I'm not sure. Well, here's our summary. Our west border, the uh, Missouri and Big Sioux floods and channel changes, Supreme Court was involved. Um, east Mississippi, um, braided channel, uh, navigation issues. Again, the US Supreme Court was involved. Uh, the north border, a total of five proposals, and it was essentially uh, Stephen A. Douglas proposal that um, was favored. It was relatively quick once they get going, um, expensive for the time, and required a congressional act. But uh, that one has had the least controversies, although there were some um, there's some land fraud based on the way the surveys turned out, but that's a whole nother, a whole nother day. Um, south, proposed, uh, south border, bold survey, erroneous, mistaken location or mis mistaken identity of the Des Moines Rapids. Double taxation was an issue with Honey War, uh, multiple commissions, resurveys, and Supreme Court cases. So none of this was easy from uh, what I've learned. But uh, uh, in some respects, not unusual because uh, Robert Lucas, our territorial governor, who had come from Ohio, did have some experience in border disputes. And one that he had an active role in was dispute between Ohio and Michigan. So, we're ready for questions. And here's an example of an early analog GPS, but it's missing something. Uh, I took this photograph wishing there was a map here, but that was back in 1992. So uh, Matt, if you've got questions on, ready for me? Yeah, of course. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, we have some time to answer questions. However, before I pose our first question, I wanna remind our participants that you can still submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Um, so please note, we may not be able to get you everyone's questions for the end of the webinar, but let's get started. So our first question for you, Paul, how do the rivers on the east and west border of Iowa lead to challenges about border lines even now? Oh, gosh. Well, the main challenge, of course, was that uh, the rivers meander. And, uh, and then, of course, we heard from the Supreme Court that when uh, they move a little bit, so does the state line. But if they move a lot, like cutoffs, um, the, the border remains. Um, issues, still issues, and unless you've got uh, assistance from today's GPS systems with satellite communication, it's still difficult to know when you're uh, boating, canoeing, fishing on the Mississippi River, uh, which state you're in for sure. Did that answer the question? It did, perfect. Uh, a next question, uh, you talked about this briefly in the, in the talk today, but which of the four borders of Iowa was the most challenging for Iowa territorial government and state government? Well, I think just in terms of uh, being a 
continuous thorn in the side. That was really the Missouri border on the southern border. And in part, it was because of the confusion. I think that's, that's what concerned um, many people the most. Uh, because just think of yourself as a landowner in uh, southern Iowa, near the, uh, the Sullivan line, and uh, you've already paid property taxes to the county, uh, county treasurer's office. And then all of a sudden, a sheriff from Missouri shows up and says, you need to pay your property taxes. So that sounds like uh, double taxation and a big headache for a lot of the landowners there. And I think that's why they really wanted to, to see the, um, all of the problems resolved. Uh, so that, I think, had the, the greatest impact on individual landowners. Mm -hmm. Um, this can, the next question is in reference to slide 31. Um, but what were Jefferson's proposals that you referenced in slide 31 and how that shaped Douglas's thinking on borders? Hmm. Could you repeat that again? Yeah, of course. Uh, what were Jefferson's proposals that you referenced and how did that shape Douglas's thinking on the border? Hmm. Well, hmm. Perhaps the question might be referring to some of these lines, and <laughs> some of these lines actually. Um, all of these lines, to my knowledge, all of the colored lines that were uh, part of the congressional proposals came from committee members. And I'm not sure, I've always wondered how did this initial proposal of 40 miles west of Des Moines? Um, be rationalized. I mean, I can understand a little bit about the, the uh, Albert Lee proposal, the diagonal. We know where that came from, uh, following the Minnesota River and the Mississippi River. And that was based on uh, Albert Lee. And remember, he was uh, part of the Dragoon uh, survey that that uh, left Fort Des Moines number one and uh, evaluated the site for Des Fort Des Moines number two and then went further north on the Des Moines River and eventually overland. But these others, I'm not sure who proposed those. And uh, I, I think they were just a matter of uh, convenience or trying to simplify the job of establishing a border, but I, I'm certainly glad that uh, Stephen A. Douglas had been influenced by Thomas Jefferson and others to propose his uh, 4330 uh, line and make it a line of latitude, even though offsets were required, took a little bit longer to survey. It was a line of latitude, so uh, geographers called it a true line at the time. Uh, so I'm not sure where all those proposals came from, but I think uh, Douglas wanted to simplify things, and I certainly can see his uh, oops, sorry, his uh, rationale for extending Iowa all the way to the Missouri River and Big Sioux of uh, the West because uh, the Missouri River had been used as a territorial boundary. Uh, next question: um, Could the residents of Carter Lake express a preference as to which state they would they should belong, and would their preference have influenced the decision? Ooh, you know, I'm not sure about the uh, the preferences. Uh, to me, I think a lot of the a lot of the local government uh, feelings have to do with land area and property taxes collected. Now, maybe that's a little bit of a jaundiced view, but I think it's a, a very practical concern that local officials have. They want to uh, maximize their uh, property tax income and 
Uh, I'm sure there were a lot of preferences expressed, uh, for example, in the newspapers. I didn't research those, but my guess is that there were, um, you know, uh, irate exchanges. And apparently uh, the, the cooler heads prevailed at least um, within the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, next question for you. Was the parallel at the confluence of Des Moines and Mississippi Rivers considered the southern border? Um, considered at, at the confluence of? A Des Moines and Mississippi Rivers. Des Moines and Mississippi. Um, in my reading, that option was never um, advanced uh, very far as a proposal. Although in, in my reading, if I can uh, pick a slide to, to point to where it's um, relatively obvious, how about... Uh, How about this one? Um, there were proposals to extend uh, or to draw the, the, the line of latitude, the true line, beginning at the confluence of the, the Mississippi and the Des Moines River here. Um, and that would have been even much further than the Iowa claim. Um, I don't think that would have held any water, so to speak, with the uh, Missouri legislature and governor, but uh, one of the reasons why Sullivan stopped his line at the Des Moines River, um, of course, there was the, um, the confusion, the uh, misidentification of the rapids, but uh, apparently it was felt like um, this, uh, what we know as the half-breed tract, area, the southern half or so of Lee County, that was not uh, ever seriously considered part of Missouri or to be uh, transferred to Missouri because at that time the, uh, the Des Moines River was uh, used for navigation and it was considered a very wide river and that uh, it would be difficult I don't know if you buy this rationale, but it would be difficult at that time anyway to cross the Des Moines River over into what we know as the southern part of Lee County. Uh, but I don't know of any proposals that uh, extended from the confluence of the Des Moines and the, and the uh, Mississippi Rivers. Um, I have questions in regards to slide 71. And it is, where are the 40, 60 mile post markers located? Hmm. Um, you know, I'm not sure if the numbering is referring to uh, the original Sullivan survey or if it was referring to the resurvey by Hendershot and Miner. See, at the time that Hendershot and Miner uh, were doing their, their resurvey, let's see if I can back up to, uh, here's a slide that shows that north-south boundary that Sullivan started with, and this northwest triangle of uh, Missouri was not yet part of the state, state of Missouri. Um, see, the, it, Sullivan surveyed north and then he went east. And he did not survey uh, west of his 100 mile north south line. So I'm not sure if the mile posts are, uh, that are referred to on that slide are begin numbering from the uh, north end of this 100 mile line or the resurvey that um, Miner and Hendershot had uh, of the entire what we think of now anyway, as the entire boundary. So, sorry, I don't, I don't know for sure, but uh, uh, at least we can tell from um, the Hendershot and Miner surveys that 
there was only about 20 miles that they considered to be a needing attention. Other Our questions? Next, next question, uh, were there any county border disputes within Iowa? Uh, well, there were changes in county lines and there were also um, counties, smaller counties up in Northern Iowa that were combined into larger counties like Kasuth. And I don't right offhand remember the names of the, the original names of the two smaller counties. Um, I think because the uh, general land office procedures to survey um, township lines were fairly well accepted at the time that there really weren't uh, issues, um, at least not serious issues between counties. There might've been some uncertainty, particularly, oh, let's see, um, the southeast corner of Polk County. So between uh, uh, Polk and Warren, the county boundary follows the Des Moines River. And that's because the Des Moines River was um, classified by the general land office as a navigable river. And their survey techniques were uh, a bit different along navigable rivers. Um, you might even have heard of the term meandered river. Um, Department of Natural Resource, uh, Iowa Department of Natural Resources still uses the term meandered river. And that, that is uh, a term that's based on the uh, navigability, if you want to think of it that way, as determined by the, uh, the general land office. But I don't know of any serious, uh, there are a few other uh, county borders that that uh, do follow rivers, but I don't know of any serious border disputes. Certainly nothing that uh, might be classified along with the honey war. I'm actually continuing the, the conversation of counties. Uh, someone asked, was a dispute over the boot heel the reason why Lee County has two county seats? Why Lee County what? Um, has two county seats. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I, I, I think, but I'm not a Lee County historian. I think that the two county seats and the north and south, it's kind of, kind of like Pottawatomie, you know, East Pot and West Pot. But I think in the case of Lee County, I think that relates to the history, the southern part being used, surveyed early uh, by uh, surveyor Jennifer Sprigg. Um, and that used as the half-breed track and then later uh, completed the surveys for the rest of the county. Um, so it might have to do with uh, early forms of government in those two areas, the north portion and the south portion, but I don't know for sure. Uh, and this will be our last question, actually, and this is in reference to what we actually talked about before we started the webinar today, on uh, Thomas Jefferson and the Northwest Territory and how Louisiana Purchase affected Iowa. Um, yeah. Can you on that? Th uh, thanks for bringing that up because uh, I've been doing some reading here lately and I did put it in an additional slide here at the very end. And uh, apparently uh, Thomas Jefferson's vision of representative government was satisfied to large extent by two senators per state, one representative for a given population size, grassroots government, which basically the township government represents. And then he also, interestingly enough, said that new states, and at first he was thinking about the Northwest Territory, the new states should be approximately the same size in terms of land area, not, not necessarily population, but in terms of land area. So the diagram on the left here is based on a map that Thomas Jefferson drew. He was trying to uh, establish 
uh, state boundaries based on approximately equal land area, although uh, Washington proposed, his proposal for Washington state uh, was much smaller than Sylvania, for example, in the Northwest corner. Uh, so those, those lines and names come from Thomas Jefferson, but his principle that new states should be approximately the same size actually was observed uh, by Congress and congressional committees so that I think uh, Stephen A. Douglas, for example, um, must have been thinking about the ghost of Thomas Jefferson when he proposed the northern boundary of 4330. And you see uh, the Plain States, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota, about three degrees of latitude by seven degrees of longitude. And then the mountain states, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, four degrees of latitude by seven degrees of longitude, um, with some extra wiggles brought about by major rivers. But then I uh, did some measuring for Iowa and we're about a three degree by five degree state. And uh, I think maybe Douglas might've been thinking about that um, if he was um, uh, agreeing with Thomas Jefferson that we ought to have fairly regularly uniform size states. Of course, population density uh, varies a great deal. And of course, they had to think about transportation and some other issues, but uh, we are a three by five state. Or if you think in terms of round numbers of miles, about 200 miles north south by 300 east west. So there's uh, Thomas Jefferson looking over the shoulders of, of congressional committees and governors. And perhaps that had some influence about. Uh, the way that Iowa got its shape. That's fantastic. And with that answer, we'll close our webinar today. I think we can all agree this has been a very informative lunch. Um, also, thank you to everyone joining us. Uh, we hope everyone will sign up for the Iowa History 101 webinars that take place on the second and fourth Thursdays throughout the year. There are many great stories from Iowa's past to tell in the upcoming months. Now, for more information and to register for our future webinars in this series, check out our website at iowaculture.gov. This webinar and past presentations are available on our website as well. And while you're there, you can look into some of our other fantastic digital programs, such as our Goldies Kids Club activities, Young Historians, or watch video recordings of the Iowa Story series, which is hosted by our Iowa City branch. Thank you all again for joining us today and have a great afternoon. We look forward to virtually seeing you all here again on Thursday, June 24th for our next Iowa History 101 webinar. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>